My Garmin running VO2 max estimate is 58 now. In this I want to discuss the run, also the most recent changes and also maybe a bigger historic picture. So first of all the bigger historic picture is that I began running at age 12 and then I ran first every day then every couple of days so basically I alternated between strength training and running. Now it's a couple of years later and one and a half years ago I got a Garmin watch with which I could now have Garmin bo to max estimates. I a couple of weeks ago noticed that in Samsung because I wore previously a, a Samsung Galaxy Active 2 and then switched to the Galaxy 4 watch 4 I could also see see VO2 max estimates also from historic times so basically in 2020 in 2019 I think I had a or 2020 beginning I had a smartwatch and I therefore had a VO2 max estimate which ranged anywhere from so 53 already was kind of the highest in the beginning and then over the years it dropped for uh, it got almost down to 55 at least on Samsung not 55 but 45 then once I got the Garmin initially it was around 52 or 53 and the December before on the Samsung it was also 53 or 52 or something like this so both kind of aligned now the VO2 max estimate is based on running so basically on my heart rate while running and I also assume that Garmin at least also basically takes into account the incline. Now, in the last couple of weeks and months, I actually had really struggled to increase my VO2 max estimate. So these are now the last six months. You can already see that there is a bump that happened or occurred like one and a half months ago. There, my Garmin VO2 max estimate was already 58. And then last week, it actually also increased to 58 again to, for the second time. Now, the drop from 58 to 57 that happened then, as you already saw, was basically the only drop I ever had on a Garmin watch in the last one and a half years. Apart from this, my VO2 max running estimate only increased. So now we can also take a look at the graph before, and we cannot click, I cannot click on the individual. Uh, points here but you can see that there is a 55 on the left and then this is the beginning where it began and then dropped then off once basically summer began so this is even a little bit more so I don't know what it is here but it seems to be 53 or 52 even so now what also has to be mentioned is that if there is a value that is 53.5 for example then Garmin already rounds up so my Garmin VO2 max estimate as of currently is actually not really 59 but it is 58 point something if we take a look on the watch itself then it shows also the 59 but on the watch itself it also shows a graph and this graph is now more short term compared to the graph that is only seen on the on the phone and so we can see or I can see here that it is 58 point something now it shows the 58 and the 50 and the 60 already as the next value because it only displays a couple of values so therefore it is currently now 50 58 point seven or something like this uh, depending on what one what one wants to see in there now Garmin does not show the individual points, I think this is also useful to have it more as a badge. I now have a VO2 max estimate of this and this is what it looks like compared to, okay, 58 point something it was, I remember, but I cannot really remember, so then it becomes really hard. But if it is these rounded up numbers or rounded down numbers, then I can kind of say and I can also rem rem remember for myself what it actually looks like, simply because there are then less numbers to remember. Now I want to go over my current training week and I also want to then include factors that I might think or that I think really might have contributed contributed to the last couple of increases to 58 and 59 and also to the stagnation before which you can kind of see. So it increased to 57 and then for the last six months almost, so for four months it didn't increase. So first of all my current training week looks like this. On Sunday I do the run. Then on Monday I do strength training, I do the same strength training on Wednesday as well as on Friday. On Tuesday I do a interval training 
which I does also which also does include running but I do it at the gym so I begin with running and I do each one minute on one minute off one minute on one minute off each for one station in total I have six stations which in total would make 36 minutes of training time but because the last rest I don't take that's 35 minutes of training time so then I do the treadmill I do rowing I do uh, the indoor bike I do elliptical then I do rowing again and I do the assault bike and that's then the sprint training now there are some benefits some downsides to the current schedule I am running on Tuesday with the sprint training I'm also I'm thinking maybe it would make more sense to just focus on running since running seems to be something where I can just immediately kind of impact whereas on the elliptical and also on rowing is it is also it is often less I have less of a I can, if I now want to go all out, it seems to often be, there seems to be more latency involved in going like this. Also because there is technology involved, often with the assault bike not so much, but with the other machines at the gym more. Now on Thursday, initially I had, so initially I would swim once a week, run once a week and also do a bike ride once a week. So these were my three cardio sessions, kind of, but uh, because sw swimming is kind of hard to uh, standardize and also so I do live next to a swimming pool it's about one kilometer away and it's very fortunate nonetheless it is very hard I found it very hard mentally to uh, basically bring together these two different things first of all there is the swimming pool and I also need to, to go there and also it every time I go there it's just an additional cost now if I instead do something else then it doesn't cost me. If I do a bike ride it doesn't cost me. But if I go to the swimming pool then additionally I have to pay. So that's one. The second thing is that um, it alternates there between outdoors and indoors. But if it is only indoors and there are a few people in the swimming pool then it is almost it's not impossible but it becomes harder I think to now try to adhere to one's own training schedule if you try to do one sprint or one two, or two sprints so 50 meters back and forth and then there is somebody who is slightly slower than you in my case often there are people that are slightly faster than me and then it is always the struggle and it becomes really hard and and then there is also this oxygen deprivation which would be a nice training effect but nonetheless I just want to run similarly I just not want to run but today for example I ran at 3.30 or at 4 actually in the morning and there was just I didn't meet a single person and this also meant that I didn't have to adjust I did not have to okay there is this person now I need to run around this person and I have to think this I just could focus on running running as hard as I can and this resulted in well the this running view to max estimate of 59 today now, um, then on Saturday I do have a kind of a day in which I do train, often also a little bit more muscular, but so what I recently did is I do a circuit training, I also sometimes do, do a, a calisthenics training or something like this, that's the Saturday and then on Sunday again I run, so that's the training week and I am not really alternating much between this. Now on Thursday, therefore instead of the swimming I do a salt bike. And I tried to search for something that is standardized and it is not dependent really on my performance but is much more an external performance and what I am currently doing there is 500 calories or 20 miles on the assault bike. Now the 20 miles and the 500 calories seem to directly translate, translate proportionally one into the other which are Therefore, it doesn't really matter which goal I have. In terms of kilometers, I don't know what this is, but probably um, the 20 miles divided by, or multiplied by 1.6, which should be something like maybe 32 kilometers. But in kilometers, it doesn't show, it does only show the miles because kilometers would be too much because it also shows basically the meters or something like this. Now, this allows me to, from week to week, compare my cardiovascular fitness excluding things like okay a via to max estimate on my watch because I can actually measure myself against the previous versions of myself because I measure myself against the power output of my previous of the previous versions of myself so um, it is 500 calories and I could also um, recalculate this in terms of joules and so I do have an external power demand and because apart from the temperature everything is kind of the same the only thing that is different is kind of me 
the bike is usually the same, I assume at least, even though there is a, a gear, which is sometimes, uh, if I'm pedaling really hard, it's kind of jumping. So I don't know what about this, if there are multiple gears in there and potentially manufacturers or uh, gym owners could set it to different difficulties depending on the depending on the target audience one could say so now i want to go into the into the most recent changes and also the changes over the last couple of years which i try to basically uh, make or implement in order to actually increase my vo2 max since i now for about two years have known more about vo2 max or i i've heard more and more about vo2 max and that it is basically the the seemingly best measurable longevity predictor and also mortality predictor. Not not really longevity, much more mortality. It seems to be the case that the higher the VO2 max, the lower the mortality risk. So I took it kind of upon myself um, to try to increase it as max as as much as I possibly can. And so this has been working uh, to some extent. So I now at least on the Garmin watches, even though this is only kind of a short cutout, which I already began to see when also taking into account the data that is measured also on the Galaxy Watch 4. So my vo max estimate already was like a few years ago. Um, let's say four years ago, it was already as high as 54. And so now I have a 59, which is not that particularly great. But nonetheless, over at least 12 months, I increased it by um, a couple of points and now again it is 59. So beginning from basically the Garmin watch, I increased it from around 53 to now 59, which is 6 milliliters per kilogram. Now one could make a rough calculation of how many years this gives me back, but the... so and I made a very rough calculation. So in order to not have to access a sp uh, an Excel sp spreadsheet or something like this, I first of all put the vo to max estimate on the watch itself. So every time I take a look on the watch itself, I see the time. I also see the date. I don't see the year because I don't have space for this, um, but it would make sense to also put the year on there. But now there's this idea of the biological age and the biological age is dependent. Basically, it's not really measurable, but one could approximate it and one could also take something like vo to max and then say, okay, there is a reduced mortality in there. One could use one metric as a filter, I think, for basically, I cannot have a vo to max estimate of 59 if I um, am obese by, let's say, 50 kilogram fat additionally. It is probably very hard or, or very, or it is just harder for me to have a vo to max estimate of 59 if I'm not also, in terms of my body composition, somewhat reasonable. And so um, one could use a metric like this as a filter and if I pass through this filter, compared to the versions of myself that don't pass through this filter, then I'm probably more likely to live longer. So I have been thinking about how to turn this into something that I actually can kind of see. Seeing, as in I don't have to do mental calculations that take me three minutes just to arrive uh, at the life expectancy. So I, so there, is, there are two, two different concepts, the life expectancy and the kind of health expectancy one could say. So the one is just how long one lives and the other one how long one lives kind of well, one could say. So in terms of living well, I said, okay, I probably have maybe, maybe in total I live 75 years. But how many of these do I live well? I just said, okay, I want to use these heuristics of maybe 50, 75, 60 or something like this. So maybe full numbers to the, to the, to the next, to the next full decade, decade, or or heuristics multiplied by five, or heuristics that are multiples of five. And so I, instead of the 75, which would be a reasonable estimate for me, also based on ethnicity and my birth year, I took the 50. So in the state in which I am now, if I am doing, if I'm able to maintain training and I'm not getting obese or something like this, and I don't have any additional sickness, uh, like cancer or like something else, which eventually uh, might come anyway, because it seems to be the case that the likelihood of getting a disease seems to increase um, as mortality also increases. So if one is able to reduce mortality, of course now this is not causal, but this is much more correlation now. Um, so back to um, now a, a number for myself. I just said, okay, 50, I have 50 years. And because a VO2 max of 50 is actually also a value that also would be kind of something that uh, would be maybe average for me, if I now have 
any point above the 50, then that's additional years. So I have 50 healthy years. Now I'm 28, which means I have 22 healthy years left, in which my brain probably works somewhat similar to how it works right now, and, and so on and so forth. And my body also works in, in, in a similar fashion. And basically, if I now, this, that's kind of the, the game I set up, to gamify the whole thing to a certain extent, because um, let's face it, or let let me face it, um, these workouts often are really hard. The, the run today was actually more on the fun side, I would say, because I had above average power and I also knew there would be an outcome that would potentially be at least a, a again, 58, 58 view as a max estimate, and because I put so much effort into this, it also is kind of a reward to then finally see the number increasing, at least slightly. And so, um, the game I set up is that basically with every increase point in VO2 max, at least the Garmin estimate and also the running estimate because I don't have a power meter or something like this. So the Garmin VO2 max estimate is the only metric that comes close to actually a proper VO2 max estimate, not estimate but measurement, and that I also can continually get with my training schedule without, additionally, without the additional cost of having to pay for an actual proper VO2 max measurement in a facility with a mask on. And so it is based basically on metrics that are continuously measured and they are also continuously measured if I keep up my training schedule, which allows this to be, I think, a very useful thing because it's a, it's a game and I don't have to go out and do additional measurements and to then also keep in mind the different variables for this measurement. For example, I also take measurements with an in-body scale at the gym, which measures my body composition, and then also gives me back a biological age, actually, a metabolic age. But um, because I sometimes arrive at different times at the gym, and because sometimes I've eaten before, because um, my macronutrient need and my micronutrient need just vary a little bit, and sometimes I am more hydrated, sometimes I'm less hydrated. Yesterday, for example, I had close to 80 kilograms measured at the gym, and today, after standing up, I had 75 kilograms, which I then also used for running, and this is now also one of the most recent changes that I used, basically, and um, I, begin, I began using more and more uh, the optimal power to weight ratio during the day in order to get basically the maximum or, or the best the best running metric I can get or the best via to max I can get. So so first of all to go through now this idea. The idea is that my body has a certain performance output. Now ideally it is in a completely regenerated state. Now ideally additionally it is also in a state in which it already is hydrated and I don't have to adjust ingest additional water and I also don't have food or much food in my digestive tract. What this gives me is basically my body so at any point in time one could one could very easily simplify it or one could simplify the, the weight down to the following points. My body in terms of the lean mass then there is also my fat mass then there is the water I have in me and then there is the food I have in me. And so if I get rid of the food and the water or I minimize these by maybe uh, going onto the run, basically uh, in, at the mi or close to the minimum point of my weight during the day anyway, which would be basically after I stand up and I go to the bathroom, which means that these two are minimized now, but my body is maximally restored, then I have basically a maximum power to weight ratio. Also, the gluconeogenesis that occurs if one doesn't eat that many carbs, which I often don't, so then what this means, I at least think this is the case, is that my glycogen stores, if I'm on a lower carb diet, are also maximally filled in the beginning of the day, versus if I then already begin to move and I already begin to drive with the bicycle somewhere, then I deplete already my glycogen stores. So I want maximally filled glycogen stores, maybe also creatine stores, not creatine stores, but creatine should be present in the body in order to basically connect the glycogen stores to ATP and KDP, or with creatine is KTP. So there seem to be these three different uh, energy chains. The first one is ATP, which is used immediately. Then there is KTP, which is supplying energy to ATP, which again provides... So this the splitting of KTP, creatine triphosphate, into creatine diphosphate, uh, the energy that is released, I think, is used for um, making adenine diphosphate again into adenine triphosphate or the other way around which I might have to look up. 
So when consumed in metabolic process, ATP converts either to adenine diphosphate, ADP, or to adenine adenosine monophosphate, AMP. Other processes regenerate ATP. It is also a precursor to DNA and RNA and so on. So now, variables that optimize basically my VO2 max estimate. First of all, the VO2 max estimate is a maximum measurement. It's basically how it's the best possible thing I can do. Um, it's not it's not, I don't wanna, I don't, it's also, so I don't have that much interest in measuring how fast I can run if I just ate five kilograms of food. Or if I, basically often during the day, I'm like two kilograms, three kilograms, four kilograms, five kilograms heavier compared to basically my minimum daily weight. And I'm also in a less regenerated state. If I already did a strength training and I afterwards would run, I would be significantly slower. Today, for example, in the initial first 10 to 20 minutes, uh, more in the first 10 minutes, I had a average pace of 4 minutes and 42 uh, per kilometer, which is basically below average if one takes the absolute value, but it's above average in terms of how fast I am. So um, this is largely due to, I think, the body being uh, in a maximally regenerated state, meaning I have fuller glycogen stores compared to average, then I also have the mental capability to drive my body a little bit higher because I, my brain also kind of is on the above average side, I would think. Then the next point would be, would be optimizing for power to weight ratio. There are sports in which the power to weight ratio is very useful, I think. One is a running. One where it is less present is cycling, for example, or strength training. In strength training, of course, there are exercises in which the power to weight ratio, again, is more crucial or more of a constraint, such as jumping, such as doing pull-ups. If you are three kilograms heavier and you weigh 60 kilograms, then that's basically three kilograms of additional weight. I think it is 20% with every single repetition you do. So in order to not look like a fool, I just did the calculation on my smartphone and it turns out it's not 20, but it's obviously 5%. Then there are carbs. Now, I, in the last couple of years, was more on the low carb side, I would say, even though for me that would still mean that I had like 200 grams of carbs in a given day often, or 300 grams, but I still would consider this to be on the low carb side compared to me eating like 500 grams of carbs or just two packs of oats in the morning. Now, in the last weeks, I again had more and more carbs. I also began increasingly to now store these carbs as also fat, which has been a change which I try to ideally revert. So I basically ate too much food in general, but the carbs also allowed me in the last couple of weeks to hit a few records, a few new records. Now what I also did in addition to basically taking creatine just before the run as of today, which might have sometimes a beneficial effect, sometimes less of a beneficial effect, because it seems to be the case that the creatine draws water. If the creatine draws water, then the, the question is whether the creatine, which seems to give me a short-term boost often, even so basically even if the body takes some time to kind of use the creatine, if I have the creatine right before the run, it might give me a short-term boost, but only if I'm sufficiently hydrated to basically now bridge the lack of hydration that I otherwise would have to ingest again with the creatine, which would negatively alter my power to weight ratio. Now, because I then have to drink 500 milliliters of water, which it means that I'm 0.5 kilograms heavier, which then means with every single step, I have to carry also this weight and propel myself forward with an additional 0.5 kilograms. Now, um, because of this, there sometimes is a beneficial effect to creatine. Sometimes there is, seems to be less of a beneficial effect to creatine. Today, I decided because I already was like 40 minutes or something like this after waking up, beginning the run. Actually, one more like 90 minutes after waking up, I think, I did go into the run, or 60 minutes. So I ingested basically the creatine I had scheduled for the day anyway, right before the run, with a little bit of water. Now, if I had run right after standing up, this might have been even better, but I didn't, so I basically ingested the, the, ingested the creatine and I took the negative aspect of now having more water in me but I also had the creatine in me. So if I have creatine, also it's, I distinguish between these two effects so much because I often run in the morning so I do have higher filled glycogen stores probably but I also then have sometimes the creatine before the run. And so there seems to be 
I a boost in which I can run very fast. Now this also this boost also seems to occur if I'm not that regenerated in terms of uh, the body. So um, if I'm maximally regenerated, then it seems to be the case that my body almost is almost beginning to jitter, wanting to move like a, a race car where the, the gas pedal is almost pedaled through, but there is no gear in, and so my body is almost, I'm sometimes almost jittery with energy, which is uh, very good, one could say, but um, now, back to the creatine. Therefore, I actually sometimes would, in the last couple of years, in the last two years, I, so one and a half year, one and a half years ago, I began to take creatine, and so I gradually increased how much creatine I would be taking, and I did begin to notice this short-term mental boost, which is not that pronounced, but it is it is still noticeable, and there is also a short-term physical boost, I think. I sometimes was able to, when I had creatine before, even just one or two grams, with additionally maybe a little bit water, I was sometimes able to bust out maybe a hundred push-ups or something like this, with which in this case would have been above average for me. Now, so first of all managing creatine, but also the problem with creatine and hydration. With hydration, ideally, then one also has a little bit of salt, or I at least have a little bit of salt. Then there is also the problem of once the glycogen begins to run out, or the maximum filled glycogen begins to run out, at least in the muscles, not speaking of the liver, there is a problem of refueling. Now, if I'm only running for 10 or 20 minutes, basically until I hit the threshold. So the initial boost today lasted for around 11 minutes and 22 seconds or something like this. I took a look on the watch and I saw basically when the initial boost, where I had ridiculous running speeds, uh, kind of ran out. Um, the first boost actually lasted for the first 30 seconds of the run in which I just was flying. I felt like I was flying compared to otherwise. I probably also had a ridiculous speed in the beginning. It's always one thing to There was one thing to just say something like this. The other thing would be to take a look at the data. So we can see that in, initially in the run, I had a running speed of three minutes and three minutes and 10 seconds per kilometer, at least um, for a few seconds, probably. I also did realize that I was still recording when I uh, basically looked the thing up on the phone, but because I don't cut my videos, I probably will leave this in, which will make for a very awkward moment. What is also very nice now about this is that I now have a bigger view to max estimate, a higher view to max estimate compared to Brian Johnson, which I um, work towards, and he always had a little bit of uh, basically points ahead, but now I seem to have catched up. Now, obviously, I'm also much younger than him, so it's not a very big achievement. Also, on that note, I did achieve a few new records on this run. First of all, my mile increased, so I now have run a mile, so it actually shows the new record here, in, at least if it showed it, a new record. So my best one kilometer is now 4 minutes and 22 seconds, and my best mile is now 7 minutes and 4 seconds. Other variables. In last, last year, at kind of the same time, my VO2max also began to increase. And it then increased by 2 or 3 points for the next couple of months, until it stopped again. It seems to be the case that if I train all year, then the summer, the high temperatures in summer, uh, seem to prevent a further increase of my cardiovascular fitness, even if I still train. It seems to be the case that this additional stress is just heat stress, but the heat stress does not translate to cardiovascular increase. It might do, but I am not able to then run as fast as I can, for example, to get a higher VO to max estimate. If then the cooler temperatures actually begin to hit, then Basically, the cooling provides, um, allows me to access now my cardiovascular ability more, which then kind of unleashes the maybe built up through the training built up cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular fitness, which then I can actually put into numbers because I can now actually run faster because it is colder. There seems to be a, cor a correlation with temperature as well as running performance, not only running but in general physical performance. And I think the ideal temperature is around 12 degrees Celsius or something like this. So as soon basically as fall and autumn hits, then I am able to put these maybe into numbers. This would be one theory, but I'm probably also not able to train as hard in summer, which then and I then am able, 
So this is one part of the story. The second part of the story is that um, I do often cold exposure in the winter. So today, for example, it had, I think, 12 degrees Celsius. I also did swim afterwards in the river shortly. And this beginning of the cold exposure, so it's a tool, a tool I can use. If I cannot use it in summer, then what this prevents is that I eat m more food. So the more food I would eat would probably, to a higher extent, fill my glycogen stores, but also allow my body to have kind of a surplus of all the different things. If one thinks of different macro and micronutrients as these different things the body needs, then there might be one thing that is constraining the whole buildup of something. If this one thing now acts as this bottleneck, then I cannot really, the only solution I would have is to scale up basically all of the calories which I am consuming. Because then basically the, the bottleneck also would increase absolutely in terms of its, its, its value. Now, if I have to reduce this in summer, then I have basically one or many bottlenecks that kind of prevent the further buildup of, of muscle or also cardiovascular fitness because I might have too little vitamin D or something like this. And therefore by allowing, so in winter I can basically do more cold exposure, which allows me to eat more calories in total, basically absolutely have more in terms of the different micronutrient needs, for example. And then this would allow me to, uh, to basically increase my cardiovascular as well as my strength fitness further or faster. Creatine, I began with 1.25 grams, then I increased to 2.5, then to 5, then to 10. Then I had a phase of several months in which I did 25 grams, and then I stopped this recently and went back to 10 grams, which I now just take with my other supplements in the beginning of the morning. Supplements, I do take turmeric, which has the main effect for me that it reduces basically how much my nose is congested in summer as well in winter. I do have pollen rhinitis, which in summer also might be a kind of preventative for uh, training better and also regenerating better because I often sleep with an open mouth then, which might be less beneficial. And I often cannot breathe through my nose in other areas as well. And I also sometimes have multiple weeks in which I am not sleeping very well because I am um, because my nose is itching and I do have to sneeze is the word I searched for. In terms of carbs, I also did take additionally 30 grams of, of spelt before the workout today. And so I also, in the last couple of years, um, at least have now some assumptions. So I noticed these things and I now have some assumptions of what might be happening with carbs in me. There might be some um, some carbs I kind of have some react reaction to parts or from. And so uh, it is, I do need basically the glycogen refilling property of the carbs also during the day. So it seems to be the case that my glycogen stores are only kind of on the upper limit in terms of how much, how filled they are in the morning. So after my longest rest of the day. Then if I begin to do something, they begin to become depleted, which also means if I now run 12 hours after having woken up, then I'm probably not as fast as in the beginning because I am using less of, of uh, my glycogen level is less, let's just say. Now to bypass this, one could then ingest carbs again. So I'm thinking of basically converting carbs, so converting fat or protein into glycogen for the muscles as a stressor for the body. It's an additional thing one needs to do. It's similar to a restaurant that sometimes gets all the things delivered, but then sometimes there are just lots of customers. And if there are lots of customers, i.e. a high physical demand, then it doesn't make sense to now also try to refill basically the whole, the whole shelf, all the shelves in the back. But it rather makes sense to just use the things that are already stored there, which in this case might be fat, but then there are, the customer cannot be served as fast because, well, the fat does not result in as much of a energy per unit of time as, as well, the carbs would. So if I run, I usually try to run now in the, in, as close to basically my wake up time as I possibly can. If I then deviate from this, what I try now to do is to wait for the other opportunities in the day where my power to weight ratio is kind of the best, which are basically after I have eaten, but then I go to the bathroom again. So there's basically this, this it's a dip in, in weight. And because my power over the course of the day roughly stays the same now, of course, it goes up and down depending on my, en depending on my energy levels, but also on, on how many carbs I had and so on and so forth. But 
Now in terms of the weight, there is a dip basically after I go to the bathroom and in this dip I have a, a I have again a, a a peak in my power to weight ratio. So there is a first peak in the power to weight ratio. Basically there is a peak in the power to weight ratio after every time you go to the bathroom. And so using these peaks in order to now access the maximum power you can have based on the power to weight ratio allows me at least or allowed me in the last couple of uh, of of weeks and months to then basically generate a higher VO to max running estimate. What this also slightly translates to, I think, is that there is an incentive definitely to avoid runs that would be happening at at times in which I know that I would have not my maximum performance, which then might in terms of training result in basically less of lesser of training because well I am training less actually because I'm what if I don't have this very right opportunity. So instead of running additionally to the gym in a state in which I am three kilograms or four kilograms heavier, what I might do instead is not do this. At least there would be an incentive to do so. There would be many other things I could mention. Uh, Instead of mentioning them, I might just show basically my current Garmin with my current Garmin dashboard, and it shows also a couple of other things as well. Now, what I began to take a look at in terms of power to weight, and also just in general in terms of body composition, instead of taking a look at the body fat of the current day or something like this, I just began to take a look at the average for a given year, which in this case is now 15.2 in terms of the body fat and 77.6 in terms of the weight. So if I'm able to reduce my weight, or let's just say the, the weight actually does not matter that much because the weight actually, well, if I do have a somewhat consistent body fat measurement, then the body fat is, I think, the better vector to optimize for. So these are kind of the rest of the values that my Garmin, Garmin cardio, cardio score has been kind of on the decline, but actually as of recently on the incline again, mostly I think because of the, the overall uh, increase in energy through food but also there, therefore higher filled glycogen stores, which allowed me to work out more intensely. I did have a phase a couple of months ago in which I, or actually one and a half months ago, I was kind of at my minimum weight of the year, which was around 73 kilograms as of the morning measurements on average. And so in this phase, um, I also was not that, um, I also often had very bad workouts, maybe because I also did so many other things. And I also did run sometimes at the end of the day and because of my sleep wake schedule sometimes kind of um, a little bit shaken up i often would basically the, it, the day would begin already and because i was still awake and it was midnight i would then already run because then this thing i had to do for this day at least was already done which also resulted in many bad runs which might at least partially be the reason that i was actually so i might already have been fitter but maybe also not and basically i had these these runs, which are basically the input for the Garmin VO2 max estimate, happen at times in which I did not have a very good power output. And so therefore, these, the 57 uh, was kind of the thing I just got again and again, until I now recently ran a couple of times after I woke up, and now I have a 59.